just begin with a little one line, five seconds quiet. My teacher, that first teacher that I met, that I described the old man, so when he was a young person, he was a very kind of philosophical, intellectual person, and he had no interest in this kirtan business at all. He thought it was kind of a silly waste of time. And he had a friend, like Chandra, me and Chandra, we study Vedanta. He had a, a, a friend that um, liked to study Vedanta with him, and they studied the Brahma Sutras together, which is a very philosophical text. And then one day his friend said, there's this famous Kirtan person, his name is Brahma Chaitanya, and um, he gets massive crowds, he's supposed to be a wonderful Kirtan leader, Let's go see him. And my teacher said, ah, I don't want to go, forget it. And he kept persisting, no, you must come, it's really something. No, 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 I, I don't want to go. So eventually his friend persuaded him, so reluctantly he went to the kirtan. So there was maybe 500 people in the kirtan auditorium, and this uh, Brahma Chaitanya was a big strapping fellow, he was a Vaishnava, he, you know, the guys with this type of length. And um, he basically was a, a Rama Bhakta, and they would basically chant Sri Ram Jai Ram Jai Jai Ram. Everyone's heard of this famous. So, Brahma Chaitanya begins the kirtan, he's got the thing there and he's gone. And he looks in the back and he sees my guru sitting in the back, he's not singing. He's just sitting there kind of checking out the thing. And he goes, hey, bolo, bolo. Bolo means sing, sing. So the story goes that reluctantly my teacher started to go, Sri Ram Jai Ram Jai Jai Ram. <laughs> And the kirtan goes on, and this went on for a long time. In fact, that was the only uh, chant they did for the whole like hour, hour and a half, Sri Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram, until, you know. At the end of the kirtan, my guru's friend came up to where he was sitting in the back of my teach. The kirtan had ended, <laughs> and he's still there with his eyes. <laughs> He goes like this, he, yeah, what? It's, over. it's over, and he claims that um, he learned bhakti, the real meaning of bhakti from Brahma Chaitanya, even though this gentleman knew nothing about Vedanta or anything about the scriptures, that the bhav that was in there, the feeling that was in there, was so moving that he realized that um, what's really required is a feeling of love towards God that grips you in a way that takes your mind to another place. The Gita says, Sarva Atma Bhavena, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might, you have to fall in love with that Supreme Being. And he credits Brahma Chaitanya for participating in that Bhakti Bhav, that Kirtan is a wonderful way to bring about that kind of spiritual feeling. And uh, ever since then, not only did he like it, he himself, even in, almost till he died, he would leave the kirtan in his own ashram. So that was uh, how he got introduced to bhakti through kirtan. Okay, 
So now we're going to move on to some a little more dense uh, subject matter here, which is I thought I would discuss at least initially. I had mentioned these are the five fundamentals of Vedanta, and I wanted to say a few words more about this concept of avidya, this concept of ignorance in Vedanta because it's so essential to, to the whole, what the problem is and what the solution is. So, for those of you who may someday pursue this even further, the one place in all of Shankaracharya's writing where we find um, his best description of exactly what is this ignorance is in his introduction to his commentary on the Brahma Sutras. People just study this alone. You can spend a long time studying this, discussing this. It's about eight pages, and it only goes, discusses what is ignorance according to Shankaracharya. So, of course, we're not going to do the whole, there's a name for it. It's called Adhyasa Bhashya, the commentary on superimposition. What is Avidya? The commentary on superimposition, Adhyasa Bhashya. So, I don't know, if, some of you may have noticed downstairs there's a, uh, a statue of Shankaracharya. Anybody notice that? Yeah. So, I noticed inside on the wall there was like a mural, and there's a picture of four monks, yeah, and Shankaracharya, they're all holding a danda, and because most people think that Shankaracharya had four disciples, it's very unlikely that that's the case, but that's the mythology about him. The only one that we know for sure who was his disciple is Sureshwara. The other guys, Padmapada, Hastamalaka, and Dota. Something like Totatacharya. <laughs> um, these three gentlemen, they're just mentioned hundreds and hundreds of years later after Shankara died. There are some mythological biographies that you don't even have to pay attention to. They're ridiculous. And they claim that he had four disciples. But we know that he had one. Yes? I have this in German. Are you interested? The Adyasi, Adyasa Bashia in German? Am I interested? I can't read it. That yeah. <laughs> so that's good to know if you'd like to be able to read this, if the English is... But everyone here, just about one person, seems pretty good in English. So you can read it in English or you can read it in German. If you want it in German, you can get in touch with German. I'm just starting to teach you. You know, just read it as, as a teacher, the you know, commentary. But oh, can, yeah. You can upload it online as well. Mm -hmm. Audio files. Mm, yeah. mm. It's a very important part of Vedanta. If you really want to study Vedanta, if you want to be not just superficial, but get into it deeply, it's a little bit of the advanced program. It's not exactly easy reading. But there's an interesting thing about it, which is, so Shankar is describing what is ignorance. And he says that ignorance is just a false knowledge. It's just a false knowledge. In Sanskrit, that word false is mithya. Please. Mithya. Mithya means false. Knowledge is jnana. So you have correct knowledge, it's called samya jnana. And you have false knowledge, mitya jnana. When I take a rope to be a, a snake, that's called mitya jnana. I have a knowledge that's not correct. It's a false knowledge, and that's mitya jnana. So for Shankara, everybody takes the self to be the not self, just like taking a rope as a snake. And he calls that mitya jnana. 
we're all under the spell of mithya jnana, false knowledge. And the whole purpose, and this false knowledge is called anartahetu, the cause of all suffering. The cause of all suffering for Shankara is a misconception, a false knowledge. So, one of those four disciples that's painted on the wall there, his name is Padmapada. And there was a Padmapada. It's not likely that he was Shankara's disciple. But in any event, he wrote a very important book. It's called the Panchapadika. And he wrote a commentary on this Adhyasa Bhashya. And what he did was, he took this word, mitya jnana, false knowledge. You see, the word mitya actually is a long A at the end. Uh, or right two A's, actually, it's better. Yeah. Mitya jnana, so false knowledge. So what, he, what Padmapada did was he took this compound word, false knowledge, and he broke it up with mitya ajnana. The actual sentence in the Bashi, in the Adhyasa Bashi is mitya jnana nimitta. The whole thing is nimitta, caused by false knowledge. Mitya jnana nimitta. If you could write that. Uh, so, mithya jnana nimittaha, caused by false knowledge. So what Padmapada did was, he broke up the words into three separate words, and he said, mithya, one word, ajnana, he broke it up, not mithya jnana, but mithya ajnana nimittaha. So then what you have is, false ignorance. Ajnana means ignorance. And he took the expression mithya jnana nimittaha as mithya ajnana nimittaha. And then he, he gave the explanation of what those three words mean. And what he said was that mithya means something that is indescribable as either existing or non-existing. Mithya means something that is neither existing nor non-existing. That's the, the definition of mithya. Ajnana, he said, was a shakti, and nimitta means the cause. So, an indescribable, neither existent or non-existent shakti is the cause for all worldly dealings. And that became the definition of a vidya. This idea, and this was probably about Shankaracharya's 8th century, this text probably came a hundred or two hundred years after that. And that definition stuck, stuck. And every Vedantin from the time of Padmapada until modern day, you go to India to any scholar, he will tell you, Mithya Ajnana Nimitta, even though it makes absolutely no sense. It's a tautology. There could be false knowledge. You can't have false ignorance. False ignorance makes... Ignorance is false. It would be a tautological sentence if you took it like that. But nevertheless, they took it like that and they postulated that avidya is a shakti, a particular power that's neither existent or non-existent. And this shakti is what covers over the truth. It has actually two shaktis. Avidya shakti covers over reality and it makes it appear 
like this world of duality. Has anybody ever heard of this concept, this, these ideas? Yes. Those people who have studied with traditional Vedantins, they've all studied this. So, <coughs> what I'm here to say is that this idea is absolutely wrong. It can't possibly be what Shankara meant by mitya jnana nimitta. By the way, this shakti was also called maya, avidya maya shakti. So that after Padmapada, avidya and maya became synonymous, pariyaya shabdas. They have the same meaning. Avidya is maya. Maya is that power that deludes us. It covers over the truth and it makes the world appear like this. There's two names for it. Avarana, Avarana Shakti, the power that covers over the truth, and Vikshepak Shakti, the power of Avidya that makes the whole world appear. And this was the Avidya that we have to get rid of if you want to put an end to your suffering. So, not only is this absolutely wrong, it makes Vedanta into a dogma. Because how many people here, in their own experience, know about that type of power that covers over the truth and projects the world? Is it in anyone's common experience? Absolutely not. It's just a dogma of Vedanta. There's absolutely no proof for it other than some Vedantin claim that there was such a thing. But there's no proof for it at all. That's the problem. It becomes, it, there's more than that. It gets worse. But So first of all, it's a dogma that you just have to accept it that some guru told you it or some scripture was written. But there's no way to prove it. No other philosopher ever accepted it. No other philosopher even knew about it. Only Padmapada came up with this business. And every other Vedantin after him came up with it. In the 13th century, and now everybody thought that what Padmapada called ignorance was what Shankaracharya called ignorance. So Shankara and Padmapada were mixed up together as one philosophy. So Shankara taught that avidya is a power that covers over reality and projects the world. And that power is not existent. Why is it not existent? Can anybody guess why they said this power was not really existent? Reality was non dual. Perfect. If it existed, there'd be two things. There'd be reality and there'd be this power called ignorance, and they both exist, and duality would be real. So it's not existent. But it's not non existent. Why? Because if there was just Brahman, how could the world even appear? So it can't be non-existent, but it can't be existent. So it's some mysterious magical power that's neither existent nor non-existent. Leave it to the logicians to come up with this. It violates what we call the law of excluded middle. A thing can't exist that's neither existent or non-existent. Either a thing exists or it doesn't exist. It's like a thing is either moving or it's not moving. There's no third thing. It's called the law of excluded middle. You can't have something that's neither, either it exists or it doesn't. But they said there's some indescribable magical thing that's neither existing, but it's not non-existent. And that's the 
the Maya Shakti, the Avidya Shakti, that's the whole problem. And the question then becomes, how do you get rid of that? How can you get rid of a beginningless power that covers the truth and projects the world? How, how can I get rid of it? Because on the effect of that avidya, and I'm just a little guy in the world, how can I affect that thing? Well, they said that you can remove it. Why? Because it's a vidya. And there is something that removes a vidya. What removes a vidya? Vidya. Vidya. So when you get a vid vidya, you can remove that power that's beginningless from beginningless time, that shakti, that maya. You can remove the covering. And once the covering is gone, then the truth is not covered, so there'll be no big shape, no projection of the world, and that would be the solution to no. our problem. No, no, they said that the big shape was remaining. That's even worse. Some of them said that even when you get rid of the covering, the big shape would remain, because here was, here was, here was the further problem. So obviously there were problems with this thing because, you see, when a wise man removes his ignorance, he still sees the Maya. So Maya can't be caused by ignorance. Why? A jnani his ignorance is gone, but he still sees the Maya. That Vikshepa is still there. So they say, well, that's not a problem. The Jnani sees the Maya, but he knows that it's Maya. The Maya is not the problem. It's not knowing that it's Maya. So that when you remove your ignorance, you still see the Maya, just like every ignorant person, but you're no longer fooled by it. You know that it's just like a dream, just like a city in the sky, just like a snake in a rope. You know that it's just an illusion. Even though you still see it, it doesn't go away. The jnani sees the Maya because you can't remove the maya, all you can remove is your own little ignorance in your brain. But that root ignorance, that this is called mula avidya, root ignorance. And this became the, the whole philosophy of Advaita. From the 9th or 10th century until today, if you go to India today, and you go to Rishikesh, and you go to the greatest pundits in Rishikesh, the greatest Shankara ashrams in Rishikesh, like Kailash ashram, or Shivananda ashram, or any Advaita ashram, and they begin to teach you, this is what they will teach you. The problem with this is that if if avidya is a shakti, then knowledge cannot remove it. If it's something that really does exist, you know, when they said it was neither existent nor non-existent, but it, so it's not nothing. It is something, but it's not quite existence. It's something. It's indescribable as either existent or non-existent. That's called anirvachaniya indescribable ignorance that because you can't say it exists then there'd be two things you can't say it doesn't exist because then how do you explain the world appearing so it must be something that's neither existent or non-existent and that power of maya avidya is what is the cause of the world this is the most common idea that all Vedantins have in the West, in India, and anywhere where they study Shankara Advaita Vedanta. First, it's a dogma. There's absolutely no proof of it. 
The second is, nowhere in the writings of Shankaracharya does this idea even show up. Even in a bad dream, this idea does not show up. So it's not found in the writings of Shankara. It's not, it does, it's a dogma that there's no proof for it other than some guru or some scripture said it. The third problem with this is, let's just grant that there is this Shakti. Shankara says very clearly, jnana gyapakam nakarakam. Knowledge can never destroy anything that exists not, nor can it create anything that doesn't exist. Jnana Gyapakam. Knowledge can only reveal what the thing is. So if there was such a thing as a Vitya Shakti, knowledge could reveal it, but it couldn't destroy a thing because knowledge never destroys a thing. It can only destroy a misconception a false knowledge. False knowledge can be removed by correct knowledge, but correct knowledge can't remove a thing. If that snake was some real something, then no amount of knowledge could remove it. But as soon as I know that it's a rope, then my mitya jnana, my false knowledge, goes immediately. But if that snake was something that neither existed or didn't exist, in this, that Maya is some magical thing that is neither existent or non-existent, then the whole Vedanta is nothing but a dogma. Number one, knowledge could never remove it. Let's just say there is such a thing, and let's just say that knowledge really could remove that Avidya Shakti. There really was an Avidya Shakti, and knowledge could really remove it. You know what that would mean? It would mean that when you really removed it, you'd become liberated. That means that your liberation would have a beginning. When you really remove this thing, this power, then you'd be free. Does anybody see a problem with that? Well, Duality is a good one, but there's even a more fundamental problem. Your liberation would really have a beginning. And anything that has a beginning <laughs> can't be eternal. It must come to an end. That's a rule in Vedanta. Anything with a beginning must come to an end. So if Mukti had a beginning, when you remove that avidya shakti, then it couldn't be eternal. That's another defect. I could go on and on, I don't want to spend the whole thing, but I'm mentioning this because many of you have either heard about these type of teachings, or you may hear about them in the future. And the reason I come to Germany to talk to you guys is mainly so that you won't be misled by the wrong ideas about Advaita Vedanta. It's mitya jnana. We all have a false idea, and that false idea can be removed by the correct idea. That makes sense. But knowledge can never remove an avidya shakti. Shankara says that avidya and maya are not synonymous. Avidya is the cause, and maya is the effect. This is very important. In Shankara Vedanta, avidya, my ignorance, is the cause, and because of my ignorance, maya is appearing. That's the effect. They're not synonymous. Shankara says, avidya kalpita maya, avidya kalpita, imagined by ignorance. Maya is imagined by ignorance, avidya kalpita. Avidya krita, av brought about by ignorance, maya. Avidya lakshana, that maya 
is just the characteristics of not knowing the truth. Avidya Lakshana, Avidya Pratyustapita, projected by ignorance. That ignorance is not knowing that it's a rope. Because I don't know that it's a rope, I've mistaken it as a snake. The cause of the snake is my ignorance. If I knew that it was a rope, I wouldn't have mistaken it as a snake. The cause of the snake is not knowing the rope. The cause of this duality is because I don't know that all of this is the self alone. This is the self, but in my ignorance I take all of this to be real. But it's just like a snake. I've mistaken the reality for something that it's not. It's called mitya jnana, not mitya ajnana. Ignorance is not some magical power. It's just a misconception in our minds. I'm the Shetranya. I am the Lord. I am the Supreme Paramatma. But I take myself to be a jiva because I've, I have a misconception I have a mitya jnana about myself. I've taken myself to be the not-self. This misconception is the cause of all suffering. And the whole purpose of Vedanta is to remove this misconception, nothing more, by teaching Admaikata Vidya, the knowledge of the oneness of the self, that there's only the self, that's all there ever was, that's all that there is now, that's all that there ever will be. What you call the world is the self. What you call a snake is the rope. What you call a mirage is the sand. That's the idea. Now we can validate the truth of this in our own experience. If you examine closely your own experience, you'll see that you have mixed up the subject with the object. You have mixed up the witness with the witnessed. You have mixed up the shetranya, the knower of the field, with the field. This is the only avidya in Vedanta, and it's the only cause for samsara. There's no other cause. It's not a magical, mystical thing that you have to believe in, and then you have to believe that actually, Nowadays, they say you can't even get rid of it because even when you get rid of your ignorance, you still see the maya. But if ignorance is the cause and maya is the effect, if you get rid of ignorance, what will happen to maya? Gone. gone. If my ignorance is gone, could the maya continue? No, it never existed never existed because you just imagined it because of ignorance. It was a misconception. So when the misconception has gone, the maya is gone. And that's why the wise man doesn't see the world. The world was seen because of ignorance. And when the ignorance is gone, the effect of ignorance has to go. Maya and ignorance are not synonymous in Shankara Vedanta. Maya, this world of duality, is just a misconception, nothing more. And if you examine your experience, you'll see that it is a misconception. The only reality, that Shetranya, which is the only reality, that witness in you. Why is the witness the only reality? Why is not the Shetra also reality? Can somebody tell me? Besides you? It's always changing. So, what, sorry? It's always changing. The Shetra is always changing. That's the reason. The Geet, see, the definition in reality of reality in Vedanta is not the definition that we use when in the waking state. This harmonium, is it real? Yes. Why? I can see it. I can touch it. I can smell it. I can feel it. It's real. Not only that, you 
can see it, touch it. There's consensus of opinion. If I was the only one who was seeing it and everyone in the room said, we don't see any harmonium there, I might think, uh oh, I'm hallucinating. Uh, <laughs> but we all see it, so it's real. Not only that, if I push my finger on one of those uh, keys, it'll make some noise. It has causal efficacy. So those are the three things. We perceive it, other people perceive it, it has causal efficacy, it's real. But the definition of reality in Vedanta is not that. Because in a dream, I see the tiger. My friend sees the tiger. If the tiger bites me, I bleed. But as soon as I wake up, the whole dream came to an end. It changed. It doesn't remain. So the real definition of reality should be that which never changes is real. And that which is changing can't be real. I believe that's Shloka 216 in the Gita. Na asato vidyate bhavaha, na abhavo vidyate sataha. 216. That which is real never changes, and that which is changing can't be real. Now you look at your experience and see what's changing. This body is changing every minute. There was a time when this body didn't exist. There'll be a time when it will cease to exist. It's changing. It can't be real. My ego, is that changing? I am happy. I am sad. I'm at Yoga Vidya. I'm going home. I practice yoga. I'm happy. I'm blind. I'm deaf. I'm fat. I'm thin. I'm happy. The ego is changing every moment. Can it be real? No. The second definition is anything that you're aware of can't be you. Whatever you're aware of is changing. Whatever you know can't be real because whatever you know changes. Let me ask you this. The dream state does it always exist or does it come and go? It comes and goes. It can't be real. Is it something that's seen? It can't be real. This waking state, does it come and go? Is it something known to you? It can't be real. That's the definition of reality in Vedanta. That which never changes which is always present with every thought, with every feeling, with every emotion, that witnessing consciousness has to be there. Prithi bodha viditam matam. It's there with every thought. But not only every thought, it's there with every perception. When I perceive anything, that witness has to be there or there can be no perception of anything. Not only that, it's the witness of the whole state that's coming and going. The waking state went, then the dream appeared to me. The dream went, then the waking appeared to me. Who is that me? It can't be the ego in the waking state because that ego came with the waking. It can't be the dream and the ego in the dream state because that came with the dream. They're both coming and going. I'm the witness of both of them. We all think like this. I am awake. I, Ira, I am awake. And then I had a dream. I, Ira, had a dream. And then I, Ira, went to sleep. And then I, Ira, woke up. That it's the ego that's passing through three states. I have three states. I'm awake, then I dreamt, then I slept, and now I, Ira, woke up and I see the world again. But if you examine the experience, you'll see that that's just a misconception. The waking ego only appeared in the waking state. 
The dream ego appears in the dream state. The ira ego of the waking never made it into the dream. Once the dream appears, we don't feel like I came from the waking. <laughs> you can have a great meal in the waking. As soon as you're in the dream, that ego is starving. They're not the same egos. The waking ego and the dream ego are different. And in deep sleep, there's no ego at all. In Vedanta, they have a beautiful saying. It goes, the waking ego never dreamt. The dream ego never woke up. The witness of both of those egos is the self of Vedanta. The waking ego never dreamt. The dream ego never woke up. The witness of both of those egos, that's the self of Vedanta. That witness of the waking ego, that witness of the dream ego, and that witness of the disappearance, that's the one thing that never changes in any state. That's the reality. That's the real. That's Brahman. That's the true self. My witnessing consciousness is the only reality. Waking and dream are exactly the same from the point of view of the witness. And whatever happens in the waking, even though I see the tiger, hear the tiger, touch the tiger, it's real in the waking. But the second the dream comes, that whole waking is falsified. When I'm in the dream, it's waking. That's what I mean by a dream. Even to call it a dream is a bias of the waking state. Because when I'm in the dream, I take it as waking. I'm talking to my friend in waking, and I say, hey, it, in the dream, I have a friend. And I say, hey, you know, last night I had this unbelievable dream. You wouldn't believe it. I was flying on a carpet. It was unbelievable. Ha, let's go have lunch. That was real, and my dream that I thought I was having that night before was false. But as soon as I wake up, I realize the whole thing was a dream. What I thought was waking was a dream, and what I thought was a dream was also a dream. And the only reality that was there was me. The waking is not different than that. The waking comes and goes. It's changing. It can't be real. That which is real is what's always here. I never woke up. When the waking appears, I don't wake up. When the waking disappears, I don't go to sleep. I am the eternal, ever-present, ever-awake, ever-pure consciousness. Nitya Shuddha Buddha Mukta Swabhava. I am of the nature of Nitya Shuddha. I'm always pure. I'm never defiled by anything or anyone. Nitya Shuddha. Nitya Buddha. I'm always awake. People think I'm awake now. And then, in deep sleep, I'm unconscious. And then when I wake up, I'm conscious. But from the point of view of your true self, your Nitya Buddha, always awake, and Nitya Mukta, your nature is eternally free. That witnessing consciousness in you was never bound by anything. Its very nature, Swabhava, is to be free forever. But because of ignorance, that mitya jnana, I don't take myself to be that. I take myself to be the ego in the waking state. I've mistaken myself for what I'm not. And the whole purpose, and once I take myself to be this, then all the problems begin, because now I want to be happy. And I go searching happiness outside. And no matter how much I look, I never find that happiness that I'm looking for. And once I take myself to be this, I'm limited and I want to be free. And I'm seeking moksha, I'm seeking liberation. Even though my nature is eternally free, because of ignorance, I want to be free. I want to be happy, I want to be free. 
I want to be peaceful. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. The nature of the self is eternal peace. The peace of the self is not what people think, oh, my mind is very peaceful. That type of peace is temporary. That's not Shanti. When there's no mind, when there's no duality, that's Shanti. That's my nature. The self is Shanti. It doesn't become peaceful. It never becomes agitated. It's eternal Shanti, eternally free, eternally awake, eternally pure. But because I think I am this body, mind, and senses, then I think I'm very impure. I have so many impurities. I have so many horrible things about me. I'm jealous of that guy, and I'm greedy about this, and I have so many defects, and I have to practice yoga, and I gotta purify my mind, and all of, all in ignorance, because we don't know our true nature. And the whole purpose of Vedanta is to, mis to just remove this misconception. How do you remove a misconception? By coming to know what the thing really is, then the misconception goes immediately. The second I know that I am that, a hum brahmas me, so hum, you may have seen it, it's written on some of the walls around here, so hum. I am that, that's what Soham means. I am that. The moment we realize I am that, it puts an end to the idea, I am this. If I am that, I'm the only reality. If I'm the only reality, what can I see? What can I hear? What can I know? There's nothing other than me. I'm the truth of everything. I'm the warp and woof of everything. I'm the essence of everything. Just like the truth of that snake is nothing but a rope. The truth of all of this is me. If I take that consciousness away, what happens to the appearance? If I wasn't there during the dream, what would happen to the dream? It couldn't last for a moment. But take the dream away and see what happens to you. Nothing. You're unaffected by the appearance and disappearance of anything. That's called asanga, unattached. The self is unattached. There's no second thing. It's just an appearance in the self. It never was, it doesn't exist now, and it never will be. The only reality is me, the unchanging reality. That witness is not in time or space. There can't be many witnesses. The witness is not in time or space. It can't get born, it can't get old, it can't get sick, and it's never gonna die. It's eternal, immortal bliss. That's our nature. The whole thing is a misconception. Mithya jnana, not mithya ajnana, some magical power that I have to get rid of, then the whole thing would be real. My bondage would be real, because there's a real cause for it. And I'd have to really get rid of that thing and really become free. The whole thing would become real. And if it was real, then the teaching that there was only one reality and that's all that there ever was, that's all that there is now, would not be true. There would have been some second thing, some magical thing called the Vidya Maya, and the whole Vedanta becomes nothing but a dogma. So I'm very critical of that idea. Everybody can think about it for themselves and see what makes sense, because I'm not selling anything here. I have no disciples, I'm not looking for students. For anybody who wants to see whether this makes sense, what I'm saying, or that business about Maya Vidya Shakti that covers 
Brahman. Nothing can cover Brahman. When anything appears, Brahman is not covered. When anything disappears, Brahman is not covered. He can't be covered. Nothing ever covers this truth. He's shining always. He's always present. He's never hidden. The self is never hidden. But because of our extrovert minds, it seems as though we're a million miles away. As soon as we turn inwards, there's nothing so close, so near, so obvious. Because it's your own self that was always there. But our extrovert mind, this natural tendency of the human mind to go out, to enjoy. I want to enjoy outside. I want to find a mate. I want to find money. I need some food. I need shelter. So the mind is naturally out. And the whole purpose of the teaching of Vedanta is to introvert the mind, to make it pure enough, subtle enough, profound enough, introvert enough. So when the teacher says to you, you are that, you can nod your head and confirm the truth of it in your own experience. That's the Vedanta. No dogma, nothing to believe in. No mystical state that you have to get. No samadhi. No chakras coming out of your sursi thing there. No nadis that have to be activated or whatever. No, none of that. It's merely a teaching. And if you understand the teaching at the very moment that you understand it, samakalameva, nothing more remains. Not only nothing more remains, when you understand this teaching, you'll understand there's nobody that could practice anything. I am that. How could there be anything left to do? It's over. That's called mukti. When there's no more knower, no more knowing, and nothing known. Because if you'll see, you're the witness. The witness is the only reality, so it doesn't know anything. It's not even a witness. I'm going to get to that when I get to the method of Vedanta. I've been talking about the witness the whole time. Could the self really be a witness? Shetranya. Krishna says you're the witness, the knower of the field. Is it true? Why not? There's no field. Why? Because they have it's dual. It would be, have to be a witness. And then where's Advaita? So there has to be a reason. Why do we call the self the witness? When we get to the method of Vedanta, we'll discuss this. So I think having said that, so that everybody's now clear that there's two different ideas about ignorance. One is a dogma that you have to believe that brings all sorts of problems. And the other is, Shankara says, Sarva Loka Pratiksha, that this avidya, the way the Adhyasa Bhashya starts off is like this. I'll, I'll spend another minute on this. It starts off like this. Yushmata smat pratyaya gochara yoho vishaya vishayi yoho tamaha prakashavat viruddha swabhava yoho. The subject and the object, the I and the you, are as different as light and darkness. They can never be mixed up. They can never be mixed up. Can you mix up light and darkness? Impossible. It's not reasonable that you can mix up the subject and the object. Then he says, Tadapi, nevertheless, because avivekena, because we haven't discriminated, avivekena, naisergiko ayam loka vyavahara, 
there is this natural, worldly, empirical dealing. Ahamidam, I am this. Mamaidam, and this is mine. Everybody feels I am this and this is mine. It's natural because we haven't discriminated. But if we do discriminate, who is the real subject and what is the real object? You'll see that this ego, this I that we're sure is the subject, I'm the subject, I see, I hear, I was born, I'm getting old. This I is the subject. For the first time when you study Vedanta, you come to understand this I is not the subject. It's the object. The subject is the witness of the I. That inside of you there's a sakshi, that sakshat akshi, the direct seer in which the eye appears, the body appears, the intellect appears, the whole outside world appears, the waking state appears, the dream appears, and to which everything disappears. That's the subject. Check your experience. You've made a mistake. You are that, what you're searching for. That witness is what you're searching for. The happiness, the peace, the freedom. You are that. But because of ignorance, we're all wandering like drunkards, seeking happiness outside, never being able to get it, trying to get a few crumbs off of the table of life, a little happiness here, a little unhappiness here, but never finding true, lasting happiness, and always afraid of our death. When I realize I am that, I was never born. I'm not going to die. This puts an end to death. This is immortality. You don't have to become immortal. You have to realize that your nature is immortal. You are the immortal reality, unborn. This comes from knowledge, not from doing anything. No amount of yoga, no amount of putting your foot behind your head here is going to put an end to that. If anything, this business will only make you more attached to this body. Do you know that sannyasis are prohibited to practice hatha yoga? Why? Why do you think sannyasis can't practice hatha yoga? Anybody have an idea? I know you do. <laughs> Please. Because it would increase the identification of the body. Absolutely. Hatha yoga increases our identification with the body. And the whole purpose of Vedanta is to stop this identification with the body. Look how stretched out I am. You can touch your toes. I can put the, my toes behind my head and stand on my pinky. <laughs> really good. You're, oh, you must be a yogi. Yogi? No. You're attached to your body, sir. You know yogi. Because a yogi is one who's yoked themselves to that witnessing consciousness. That's the meaning of yoga. It has nothing to do with that other stuff. Eighteen chapters of the Bhagavad Gita. If anybody can show me anything about asanas in there, I'm going to give them a prize. There's only one place in the sixth chapter where Krishna tells Arjuna, learn how to sit in a comfortable asana so that you can meditate. Just because if you can't sit comfortably and your knee is killing you and your back is... So he says, sit in a comfortable position. That's as far as Hatha Yoga goes in the Bhagavad Gita. There's no more of it than that. And if you can't sit comfortably like that, it really doesn't matter. You can lay down like that. It's just as good. <laughs> as long as the mind could be resting enough so that it can do this type of discrimination. What is the subject? What is the object? What is appearing and disappearing? What is coming and going? And to whom is it coming and going? Who is it? If it's all an appearance, who does it appear to? Me. Who's that me? Ira? Ira is appearing to me. 
That me is Krishna. That's the Krishna that abides in the hearts of all beings. Shetranya chapi ma vidi sarva shetrashu. Know me to be the witness. That's the real Krishna. He's never away from you, Krishna. He's your own self. When you know that, you'll be Krishna. Krishna says, Jnani tu atmaiva me matam. But I consider the wise man to be my very self. When you know the self, you'll know Krishna. Krishna is yourself. He's not some guy living in Vaikuntha. That when you the body goes, somebody's going to travel somewhere and you'll meet him up there and you'll be with all the bhaktas and we're all going to sing Hari Ram, Hari Krishna. <laughs> Sorry, that is not the teaching of Advaita. That's not the teaching of the Upanishads of the Bhagavad Gita. This is, this is something else. <coughs> okay, I'm going to get back to the text now for a little bit and then we'll take a break. So, just a, a review. We did the first two shlokas. Idam shariram kaunteya. This body is like a field. He who knows it is the field knower. That's the first shloka. Second shloka was Shetragnya Chapi Mambidi. That witness in you, know that to be me. That's Paramatma. That witness is the Supreme Self. You should know that. Because we don't know that, because we don't know that we're Krishna, the Supreme Reality, we take ourselves to be this, the Sharira. Aware the witness of the Sharira, and that's Krishna. Krishna says, Shetra Shetra Nyor Jnanam, the knowledge of what is the Shetra, and who is the Shetranya, the knower of the field. Etat Jnanam Matam Mama, that's what I consider to be the knowledge, because that knowledge will remove the ignorance, the misconception, the Mithya Jnana. What, mythi what false knowledge do we all have? I am Ira. I live in Woodstock. I was a young man. I moved to the village. I came to India. I'm now in Germany. I'm teaching you guys Vedanta. All of that is nothing but ignorance. None of it is true. Mithi again. Why? Because all that there ever was, is, or will be, is myself, unchanging, ever the same, not in time, not in space. That's the only reality, me. That's all that ever was. There's nothing other than me that's the same as me. There's nothing other than me that's different from me. And in me, there's no multiplicity. That's called Advaita. The third chapter, he says, Rishi Bia Buddha, this teaching about the witness and the witness, it's been sung by the Rishis in the Upanishads. It's in the scriptures, Chandobhya Buddha Gitam. It's been sung in the, in this, in the scriptures, Chandas is the scriptures. Brahma Sutra Padayi, in the Brahma Sutras. So what's being taught in the Gita is not a new teaching, it's an ancient teaching. Whatever is taught in the Gita has to be in harmony with the Upanishads. Remember I told you there are three groups of literature to study Vedanta. The Upanishads is Vedanta. Vedanta, those texts that are at the end of the Veda is called Vedanta. The end of the Vedas is the Upanishads. It's the culmination of the whole Vedic teaching is the Upanishads. And it can be summed up in three words. The whole Upanishads. Tat, Tvam, Asi. You are that. Nothing more. If you can understand those three words, everybody goes on. We can't understand it. It makes no sense. I am not that. 
I am this. I live in Hamburg. I live in Berlin. I'm coming here to yoga. I know who I am. Don't tell me I'm that. I'm this. I... But the teaching says you are that. You are not this. We can't understand it. So anyway, this is what the rishis have said. And this is what uh, the scriptures have said. And this is what the Brahma scriptures have said. And now I'm going to tell you this. What is the Kshetra? First he says the Kshetra is the body. But then he says Mahabhutani, the great elements are also Kshetra. The great elements. The Ahankara, the ego, not just the body. The ego is Kshetra. That's the most important thing. We all think the ego is the me. But it's Shetra. It's known to you. It's changing. It appears. It's something known. It's an object. It can't be me. The object can never be the subject, like light and darkness. Just like a finger cannot scratch itself, no matter how much <laughs> it can scratch the object, but it, the subject can never be the object. But I take myself to be the object, even though I am the subject. This mixing up of the self and the not-self. Mithya jnana, a false notion. Even when I say, I am thin, that thought, I am thin, the witness, is the witness, just because I said, I am thin, do I become thin? The witness is not thin. If I say, I am fat, is the witness fat? The witness never has any of the qualities of the witness. But we take the I, the witness, and identify it with the witness. This is the misconception. It's natural. So, he says, he lists all of the things. Desire. I feel I desire. Desire is Kshetra. He says, Dritti, firmness. I'm very firm about that. I am very firm. But firmness is just a quality of the mind. Hatred. I hate that guy. That hatred, is it the subject or the object? It comes and goes. It's an object to you. That hatred appeared. You know it now. Later on, You'll be off to something else, it'll go. It can't be your nature. It's an object to you. But I identify with that hatred and I say, I hate. The witness doesn't hate. The witness doesn't, is not happy when the mind is happy. The witness is not sad when the mind is sad. It's the witness of the mind, unattached by anything that appears. Everything that appears is a quality. But the witness is nirguna. It has no qualities. What color is the witness? Can somebody tell me? Is it red? How about it's the color of the sun? Maybe? It's blue. Eternity. Like blue, like eternity. I can see it now. It must be like the light of a thousand suns. The witness is no, whatever quality you can think of is an object to the witness. You can never objectify the witness. It has no qualities. It has no form. Akara, nirguna. It is, you can't think of it because you can only think of things. The witness is not a thing. The witness has no form, no shape, no color. It's not big or small. It's not round or square. It's not red or blue or yellow. Or... It has no qualities. Every quality appears. The gunas are rajas, sattva, and tamas. But the witness is the witness of the gunas. It has the gunas of the qualities. But the, the self is gunatita. It's beyond the gunas. 
It has nothing to do, the gunas can never touch it. But because we're identified with this body, we become one with the gunas. And we're all very tamas. Every one of us is very tamas. All we want to do, all I want to do, I'll talk for you guys, all I want to do is just lay around and have fun. That's called tamas. So the first, I'm going to go off on a tangent here. The very first sadhana in Vedanta is to get rid of the tamas. Because as long as we're filled with tamas, you can never know the truth about yourself. We have to get rid of the tamas. How do you get rid of the tamas? Utishta Arjuna, Yujasva, get up, enter into the battle. Don't go sit in a cave somewhere. The teaching of the Gita is you must act. By acting, you get rid of the tamas. That's the very first step of Vedanta. Do your duty, whatever it is. Are you a husband? Then you do your duty to your wife. Are you a wife? Then you have your duty to your husband and your children. Are you a professional? Then you have a duty to go to work and take care of your profession. We all have some duty to do. Utishta. Don't just sit around doing nothing or it will be just Thomas. You must get up and act. The Gita teaches karma, not sitting around doing nothing. So the very first part of the sadhana is called nirantara karma. You must continuously act, engage in the world, do your duty. What happens when you do your duty? You overcome the tamas and you become rajas. Action is rajas. You overcome tamas by rajas. So now you're acting. But rajas is also a type of a bondage. It's filled with passion and desire. You're acting to get things. I want to get this, I want to get that. I'm acting to get more money, to buy a nicer house, a nicer car. Rajas is passion, desire. So how do you overcome that? You have to do your duty with no desire for the fruit of your actions. It's called karma palatiyaga. You have to give up the desire for the fruit of your works. What happens when you do that? Then the mind becomes sattvic. I'm doing this very quick. Karma yoga is a big subject. We can spend five days on it. I'm going to do it in five minutes here. When you do your actions with no desire for the fruit, because if you're doing it for the fruit, Suppose you want that girl or that guy. If you get the girl, if you get the guy, oh, I'm so happy I got it. You'll find out later it won't be that happy. <laughs> anyway, when you decide, as soon as you get it, you become elated. Suppose you don't get the guy or the girl. I'm just, or the money. I want the money. Suppose you get some money. Ah, I got the money. You're very happy, but you'll see people with money. You'd see this guy, the billionaire's in jail now. What's his name? Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein. He's got plenty of money. It didn't work out well for him. So, but when he got the money, I'm sure. If you don't get the money, oh, gee, I got no money. <coughs> what am I going to do? You, you, this suki duki, suki, as long as you're after the fruit, the mind is. But when you're no longer interested, whatever comes is prasadam. I'm doing it not for the fruit, but as an offering to that Supreme Being. Then that karma begins karma yoga. Now the mind becomes sattvic. When the mind is no longer attached to the fruits of your work, I don't care whether anybody follows my teaching, I don't care if you agree with me or disagree. I'm doing my duty to my guru. I'm doing seva. I'm teaching because he did a great thing for me. 
and I feel I can share it with other people. They can take it or not take it. I'm not going to be affected. I'm doing my duty, but it's up to you what you decide to do with this. That attitude of not worried about the fruit, I'm doing it as worship to him, my duty. Now the mind becomes sattvic. But sattva is also a type of golden chain. Even sattva is part of the gunas. So in order to get rid of the sattva, the next stage, which is much more difficult, is not only not to be, because if you're not attached to the fruit of your works, will you still get the fruit of your works? I'm doing it, but I'm not attached to the fruit. Is the fruit going to come to you anyway? Yes. Absolutely. You don't become free from the fruits of karma merely because you're not attached to it. The fruits are coming. So, that's still a problem. You don't get free from the fruits of karma. And that fruit is your bondage. Because sometimes the fruit is what you want, and sometimes it's not what you want. So you don't become free merely by giving up your attachment to the fruit. Because you're doing the action, the fruit has to come. So the next step is this. The third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is the place to study the beginning of this idea. It's not just a question of not being attached to the fruit of your action where I'm doing my duty, I'm doing my karma, but I'm not attached to the pala, the fruit. Now the next stage is that there are three ingredients whenever I do an action to get the fruit. Let me give you my example. I'm reading a magazine and I see a beautiful BMW. Boy, it's nice. Then I'm walking down the street and I pass a BMW showroom. I see the thing up close. And, wow, that's pretty nice. That first look at it, the very beginning is called the Sankalpa. First we get this kind of a volition that rises up in us. Hmm. That would be something I, I would like to do. And then that sankalpa becomes a desire. I want that BMW. Shit, it costs a lot of money. All right, I'm going to work. I'll save up. I save up all the money. And then I go to the showroom. I give the guy the money. And now I get the BMW. That's the fruit. So there are three things. First, I have to think about the thing. Then I have to get a real desire for it. Then I do the karma, the action to get the thing. And then I get the fruit. The sankalpa, the karma, the karma pala. All three of these things, I have no attachment to any of them. The, the, the idea for it comes up. My desire for it comes up. The action to get that thing comes and the fruit. I have no attachment to any of it, not just the fruit. The idea to get it, the activity of getting it, and getting it. I have no attachment to any of that. That frees you from the bondage of karma. It's called Naish Karmiya. The state in which you are free from actions. How karma yoga, Krishna says, I will teach you the secret how to be free from the karma bandhana, the bondage of karma. Everybody is bound by karma because I feel I do it and I get the result. And that result is a bondage. I'm going to teach you the secret. And the secret finally is to get unattached, not only to the fruit, but to the whole rigmarole. That it's all just an object to me. The, the idea of it, I'm the witness of that. The activity, I'm the witness of that. The fruit that came, I'm the witness of that. Because I didn't do the action, 
I don't get the fruit of it. That's how you become free from the bondage of karma, through discrimination. Only a discriminating person can get totally free from karma. Then you attain naishkarmiya. Krishna says in the third chapter, man doesn't become free from karma merely by abandoning karma, but by performing karma in the proper way as karma yoga. How to make karma into a yoga so that it no longer is a bondage to us, but the karma becomes a sadhana that takes us to the goal that karma becomes karma yoga. The karma yokes us to that supreme reality. And even this stage of being free from the bondage of karma is not the end. But at that stage, you've gone beyond the three gunas. The gunas are all operating. Krishna describes it like this. Guna guna ishu anuvartamte. The gunas in the form of this body, mind, senses, and ego. It's nothing but gunas. Are moving against the gunas. Guna ishu amongst the gunas. The gunas in the form of this body, mind, and senses is moving against the gunas. Not kim chit karomi, but I do nothing. It's a verse in the Gita. But I do nothing. That's how you get free from the bondage of karma. Seeing the fact of the matter, that you're the unchanging witness, and it's only the gunas moving against the gunas. There's another shloka in the Gita that says, Indriyani indriyarteshu anavartante. The senses are moving against the sense objects, but I do nothing. Same meaning. That's how you become free. But is that the final stage, when you're free from all the gunas? Because there are still gunas, but you're free from them. But in the final stage, there's no gunas. So even being free from the gunas is not the end. Naishkarmiya is the state, the state where you're free from action is the jnana nishta, the nice karma siddhi, the real final stage that jnana nishta, before you become a jnani, you have to become a jnana nishta. That jnana nishta is called a parabhakta, that is the supreme devotion. That is called when all that you think about is that witnessing self, that never changes, that's always present, free from action. When the mind is on that, in the 18th chapter, the 50th shloka, Krishna finally says to Arjuna, he's finishing up the whole teaching. He says, Naish karma siddhi praptao yata brahma apnoti tatshunu. Having attained Naish karma siddhi, the perfection of actionlessness, that sadhaka, who is at that stage where he's not attached to any karma, his mind is totally, totally on that inner reality. How that sadhaka comes to attain Brahman, Tatshrunu, that shows that that stage is not the end. Even the one who's freed from the gunas, he has one more stage, and that's to realize, I am Brahman. There's no gunas, there's no indriyas, there's no nothing. I am that. Then the teaching is over. Krishna finishes up his teaching in 1866. You guys recite it every night at the Arti there. Sarva Dharma Parityaka, giving up all other not self. Dharma here means not self. Having abandoned all dharmas, all not self, serve a dharma parityaga, ma mekam sharanam, take refuge in oneness with me. Ekam, oneness, ma with me, with me, your true inner self. 
Ma mekum sharanam. Take refuge in that vraja. Take, take sharanam, refuge, ma mekum, and give up all of the dharmas. Sarva pape vyaham vimoksha yishami masucha. If you do that, I will release you from all sin. Masucha, don't grieve. If you take oneness with me, you'll be free from all sin. The sin of thinking that you are the not self. That's the only sin there is in Vedanta. The sin of avidya. I will release you from that. That's the culmination of the whole Gita. We have to give up all of their interests and fall in love with that reality. Turn towards that with all your heart, with all your soul. You know the golden rule of Christianity? Love thy God with all thy soul, with all thy heart, and with all thy might. And love thy neighbor as thyself. If we could even try that, if anybody could do that, you'd be better than 99% of all so-called Vedantas. That golden rule, love thy God with all thy soul, with all thy heart, and with all thy might. Turn your mind to Him. Fall in love with Him. Become infatuated with Him. Desire Him. That's the spiritual life. Being devoted to Him only means turning your mind towards Him. That devotion, instead of being devoted to making money, to getting things, to power and greed and, and security, there's no power, security, or anything out there. The only refuge is there. It's in Him that you'll be safe. <coughs> because in Him, there's no second thing. Fearlessness, that's the safety of non-duality. As long as you're in duality, something can get you, something can cut you. When you become ma makam, one with me, take refuge in that, you'll be free from all sin. That's the culmination, 1866 of the Bhagavad Gita. There's no higher teaching than that. And the whole Gita is to teach you this sadhana of beginning. First, do your duty. Then do it without an attachment to the fruit. Then do it without attachment to the whole karma. At that point, you're at the third stage of bhakti. Remember I told you there were four bhaktas? The one in distress, the one who wants to know God, and the one who now knows God and his mind is totally turned to that and he wants that alone. That's called the Artha Arti. That's the Jnana Nishta, the one who's established in that. And the final stage, the highest bhakti, is the Jnani because the Jnani is Krishna. The Jnani is the Self. The jnani is the absolute reality. There's no more division between the devotee and the object of devotion. They become one. That's called the supreme devotion. Okay, we're going to take a break. Let's meet back here in 10 minutes. 10, 15.